I'll see if we can find out what that's about. So good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, today's lecture. This is actually the, the uh, third presentation of the Richard Hammond Lecture, named after our founding dean, uh, Dick Hammond, who is sitting here uh, with us um, today. Uh, the uh, When this was established, it was really so that we would have a tradition of having an annual lecture and uh, keep uh, Dick's contributions uh, in front of uh, the school. I would can only imagine, I've heard the story now many times about the uh, effort that Dick and others put into negotiating the founding of a new school of public health in the state of Colorado, a very much needed school that involved three uh, universities. Uh, imagine, uh, imagine that. So um, thanks to uh, Dick for all that he did. I'm delighted today to uh, welcome a long-term colleague and friend, Michelle Bell, uh, here as the third Hammond lecturer. I'm gonna read all your fancy titles and then I'll just talk about you. Um, so Michelle is the Mary E. Pincho Professor at the School of Environment and Professor of Environmental uh, Health at uh, Yale and appointed in several departments reflective of her broad uh, interdisciplinary background. I first met uh, Michelle when she was a doctoral student in environmental engineering uh, at Johns Hopkins. She had the good idea that the combination of environmental engineering and epidemiology would be a powerful one, which has proved to be true across her uh, career. She's investigated a wide variety of environmental problems using her skills uh, in bringing together data models and asking the right questions, questions for which results uh, could make a difference. These have been related to air pollution, climate uh, change and health, and other issues uh, quite, uh, quite broadly. Uh, through her career now, she's mentored her own substantial group of uh, doctoral and uh, master's uh, students. To say uh, Michelle is multidisciplinary is an understatement. I just want to read a few of your degrees. Is that all right? Thanks. <laughs> in any case, um, uh, Michelle holds a, a, an undergraduate degree in environmental engineering from MIT, a master's in environmental engineering from Stanford, more recently a master's in philosophy from the University of Edinburgh, a master of science uh, in environmental management and economics from Hopkins, and her PhD. I think just two of her honors when the uh, NIEHS announced its first competition for the ONES Awards, the Outstanding New Environmental Sciences Scientists Award. Michelle was a winner, uh, and more recently she was elected to the um, National Academy of Medicine. So great to have you here, uh, Michelle. And she's going to talk about air pollution, weather, and human health, learning from our past and bettering our future. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. Thank you to everyone online. I have to say that when I was a PhD student in environmental engineering, I was studying air quality modeling, running um, atmospheric and meteorological models, but I, I kept seeing one line in all of the papers, like this is important because, you know, human health. So my master plan was to take the one quarter epi class over at the School of Public Health. And after that class, I was hooked. And so I redesigned my entire doctoral dissertation in my career. And John Samet taught that, taught that class. So we can give him uh, credit or blame, depending on how you feel about an hour from now. <laughs> That's my joke. Um, so for today's talk, one of the key themes that's going to run through everything that I'm going to say is basically the idea that everything is connected through these inter interconnected systems. And I really like this figure. It's, it's not from my paper, but it's from a paper a few years ago that has... Uh, a graphic that depicts how our health is affected by the ecosystems with both nature and the built environment, by social systems. We could think of things like social cohesion, um, economics, by, of course, the physical and chemical stressors, and by lifestyle and behavior as well. And, of course, all of those things are related to climate change. And I would add that all of these systems are happening simultaneously with the changing climate. And many of these systems um, also relate to issues of environmental justice as well. So I think this figure, we could even expand out larger. 
And so this is a brief outline of the talk I prepared for you today. It is not going to be a traditional research seminar where I take one project and go into depth in one project. What I thought would be more interesting is to kind of go through what, what I think are some key themes in my work in environmental health and to give you some kind of research vignettes. I'll give examples for our own research for each of these. And so I'm very interested in environmental history. So first I wanna talk a little bit about I'll talk about links to COVID-19 and temperature and mortality. Then I'll briefly want to touch on some issues of environmental justice and climate change. And then if there's time, I just will have a, a few other ideas I just want to present. And hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, so I know there are a lot of people here that study air pollution, but a lot of people here that study many other things as well. But if you're into air pollution, you probably know about the London fog in 1952, which is famous in the air pollution world. But just to give you a sense of it, the air, these are photographs from there, but the air pollution was so thick that you couldn't see your became very apparent. So we, the scientific community, we knew that air pollution was harmful to human health before this. But this event, and then some other events like Denora, Pennsylvania, 1948, and others around the mid-1900s really were the catalyst for modern day scientific study of air pollution and health, for modern day policy of air pollution and health, and for the general public being interested. And my favorite photograph is the one in the bottom middle. That's a police officer leading a bus on foot with a flashlight because the bus driver couldn't see. So the, the pollution and health response was so bad that the morgue ran out of space, funeral homes ran out of coffins, and florists ran out of flowers due to all the funerals. Even theater performances closed down due to low visibility. So imagine you and I not being able to see each other indoors because of low visibility. And this is a figure from the original government-based report on the London fog in 1952. This is published 1954. And there are a few things I want to point out. One is... The bottom two lines are air pollution. That's a whole lot of data for air pollution in 1952, but we really should think of it, or in my mind, I think of it as an overall indicator of air quality because there are many pollutants not being measured. And the levels before the episode were typical for that time of year in that community. Um, they're already really high. And then you can see this is uh, mor mortality for the greater London area. You can see it skyrockets and, and you can see a very clear relationship with the air pollution level. So this is 1954 when this is being published. At that time, there were six computers in all of England, but you actually don't need, you know, causal inference analysis and all the tools we use now to be able to see that there really appeared to be something going on. And so, like I said, I'm interested in history and how everything is connected. So I, I think it's interesting to look at what were people talking about for the London fog in 1952. So these are newspaper clippings from December 1952 in London. And here, this news newspaper clipping talks about transportation stops. Uh, so transportation basically came to a standstill. This talks about problems in the supply chain with milk um, supply being hit. Also robberies, tons of crime happening because you could hide in the fog. Um, more about traffic in Thebes, some estimates of the economic costs, but none of these economic costs included health, so they're all underestimates. More on, on crime and so on. So if we look at what was happening, it wasn't just health. It was transportation, commercial services, animals, agriculture, economic impacts, so they argue they're underestimates, crime, injury, accidents, and then also health. <laughs> And then fortunately, we don't have very often in the world levels as high as what we saw in London 1952, at least not in London in the US. But unfortunately, we do still have very high levels of air pollution in many parts of the world. These are just a few examples. And it's interesting because I talked to some community members who feel that you know air pollution is better now, air pollution has come down. That's true for many parts of the world, but for many parts of the world, it's the opposite. Uh, we actually have air pollution increasing in many parts of the world due to unprecedented urbanization, often unplanned expansion of transportation networks and industry and so on. So unfortunately, air pollution is still a big problem for human health, and it's actually still a big problem in the United States. So this is a map showing areas that don't meet the eight-hour ozone standard. These are health-based standards set by EPA. 
And over 20 million people in the US live in areas exceeding particulate matter standards, and over 90 million people in the US live in areas exceeding ozone standards. And so the global burden of disease estimates over 4 million deaths per year worldwide just from particulate matter alone. And air pollution causes a higher public health burden than water uh, quality issues, than sanitation issues, than malnutrition, and then all three of those combined. And the World Bank estimates about $1.8 trillion a year in health costs from air pollution. I think there are many aspects of air pollution in, in terms of their impacts on health and society that we don't fully understand. So I would argue that that is quite likely an underestimate as well. I also want to make one more point on this figure. If you happen to live in an area that's in white on this figure, that's not out of attainment with the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. Uh-oh. Was it me? Did I do it? I fixed it. <laughs> That never happens. So these areas that are in white that are in attainment with the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, that does not mean the air pollution is not harmful. So work from my team and many other teams has shown that both for ozone and particulate matter, we have observable health impacts well below the current standard. So the actual number of people living in areas with unsafe air pollution is gonna be much higher. And so next I wanna talk about um, some of our research. And I wanna give you some examples on air pollution and also on weather, but um, there's a lot of studies on air pollution showing that it's harmful. But I thought what, what might be interesting is to share with you two of the studies that we did looking at air pollution in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the first study we did was led by um, a research scientist in our group, Ji Young Sun. <clears throat> and here we were interested in what was happening to air pollution levels during the pandemic. So we saw dramatic changes in emissions of air pollutants and pollutant precursors due to um, changes in transportation, people, uh, many people, not everyone, <clears throat> working remotely, education shifting to online, fewer people on the airlines and so on. And so we looked at 10 states and also the District of Columbia looking at when shutdown mitigation measures happened and comparing air pollution level before and after. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about methods today, but we use difference and difference approaches to compare the PM2.5 levels during that mitigation period to what we think they would have been had the pandemic not happened. Um, and we considered things like different dates of the shutdown, meteorology, and so on. And so these are uh, figures just showing a time series of pollution for two of our states. So it's top for California in blue is an average of what the air pollution levels looked like before the pandemic. Um, and then in orange, you see what they looked like during the pandemic. So just a few things to point out. You can see that overall in California, it looks like the pollution levels decreased, and they did during the pandemic. But before the pandemic, or before the, the state of emergency and the stay-at-home order, they were higher than normal that year. Another point I want to make is that there just is a whole lot of variability. And one thing that we did for this study is we used monitoring data. So those of you who work in air pollution may know that there's many different models, a huge array of models where you can estimate air pollution everywhere, but we used monitoring data, which meant that we didn't actually capture everywhere in California. Does anybody want to take a, a guess as to why we wanted to use measurements instead of the model estimates? I don't ask trick questions. So if you have a guess in your head, you're probably right. So these models are designed for a time period before when the pandemic happened, when the transportation systems and emissions and so on were quite different. So we decided rather than include that uncertainty, we'll just look at places that are monitored so we know that these measurements are really true. And then for Texas, we see a little bit of a different story, a lot of variability, but the air pollution levels do not appear to be decreasing after the pandemic. Now, what we modeled is not just averaging us and up and comparing it before and after or comparing it from that time period to the several years before, because you want to account for temporal trends. What you really want to compare is the orange line after the stay at home to what that orange line would have been without the pandemic. And this is what we found. So for most areas, we found that air pollution levels decreased, especially for California, but not everywhere. Uh, Pennsylvania is not showing up because of the scale. It has a tiny, tiny increase. So basically the same. But Texas actually increased 30% higher pollution under the stay-at-home orders than elsewhere. And the state of Washington increased as well. So overall, particulate matters levels reduced 12.8%. Um, 
seven states in DC, we saw a decrease, but then we saw an increase for, for three states. And there's some numbers of some of the examples. Any thoughts as to why air pollution could increase? Yeah. Wildfires could be part of it. Yeah, traveling, no, no, seriously, traveling for stock, stock, stocking up on things. And also like how much stuff have you had delivered to your house now versus before the pandemic? At least for my house, we have a, had a lot more home delivery. So all those trucks from, from Uber Eats and Amazon and so on were on the road. So for some communities, we think that that made an impact as well. So, you know, overall, there've been a lot of studies showing and discussion that overall air pollution levels decrease. That is true. It is not uniformly true everywhere. And then there were several studies that came out suggesting links between air pollution and COVID-19, suggesting that maybe there are higher rates of, of infection in areas with higher air pollution. And then other studies suggesting maybe there was more severe COVID-19 outcomes, uh, such as like more likely to succumb to mortality in areas with high air pollution. And these studies were very useful and very informative. And as you might suspect, were, were being done very quickly in rapid response to the situation. But they had some limitations as well. And so one is that the early studies used aggregated data, such as at the county level. So we only have health data at the county level. So we're only averaging air pollution exposure at the county level. And another is that there could be a lot of potential spatial confounders. So what other things are different about populations across space or even within a smaller space within a county? So we did a study with my former postdoc, him, and also uh, Dr. Samet was a co-author on this paper as well. And we looked at short-term exposure to air pollution and risk of COVID-19 mortality for people infected with COVID-19. So it's for the Cook County, Illinois area, which is where Chicago is. And the advantages of this study are several. One is that we had individual level data um, and we know where the people were. And also that the COVID-19 deaths were confirmed by a medical examiner. So this did not have the strength of some of the earlier studies in terms of being a national study. We looked at a much smaller area, but we were hoping to really get at addressing some of the limitations of the earlier studies. So we looked at ozone and fine particulate matter, and then some of the confounders we used were looking at meteorology, viral transmission, seasonality, temporal trend. We looked at hospital beds, many other things as well that aren't listed here. And this is a map showing you the monitoring stations, which are yellow stars. Again, we decided to use monitors rather than the modeling estimates because the modeling estimates were designed for a pre-pandemic era. So maybe they hold up under this new system with different emissions uh, profiles, but maybe they don't. So we decided rather than introducing a level of uncertainty, we would use monitors. And you can see there actually are quite a lot of monitors. And there's a the approximate location because you can't give their specific location, but we actually know exactly where people lived during this time frame. And we found that overall, people who were exposed to higher level of air pollution were more likely to have COVID-19 related death. These are of people who have infection. Um, but I wanna bring out one of, of Hyung Guk's results in particular. This is looking at, just for men, looking at differences by race, ethnicity. And you can see for black males, their risk, so this is just the risk, this is, this is the impact of air pollution. Let me rephrase it. The association between air pollution and risk of COVID-19 mortality for people with, 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 with infection. And it is statistically higher for black males than Latino white males. And you can see it, it's so high, we actually had an issue with the scales, which is put the little arrow there. But this is really important because it gets to this concept of how so many different things are, are connected. So you here you have a population that when they have COVID, they are more likely to die from COVID. They also are more likely to live in high air pollution areas. We also know that Black African Americans are more likely to have a high health response for a given increment of air pollution for other health outcomes like risk of hospital emissions or mortality. And so those are, you know, some of the studies that we did on, on air pollution. And I think that all the studies that have been done on air pollution, there's so much amazing work that's been done, but I really hope that for the future, what, what I'm hoping to do is really to connect to broader systems with things like environmental justice, um, climate change, COVID-19 and so on, rather than more and more studies of this pollutant is associated with this health outcome. And maybe that looks, maybe that's looking at pollutant mixtures and so on, just ways to kind of expand out the research question. Um, and I also wanna give some examples of temperature. These are photos from India showing high temperature. Um, when I first saw the one in the upper right, I thought it was some type of like 
cool Photoshop effect, but it's not. That's pavement melting due to the extremely high temperature in India. And here I wanna highlight work from my former PhD student, Amruta Nori Sarma, where we looked at the relationship between heat and mortality in uh, several locations in Northwest India. Uh, there are five cities there, two of them are very close together. So we combined those. And so if you look at our now four locations, this is the relationship between temperature and risk of, of mortality. Nothing surprising. We see that temperature is harmful for you. High, high temperature is harmful for you. But there's several points I want to make on this figure that I think are really interesting. One is that um, we actually see a cold impact. And this is something that's quite interesting. Like we can, we can find impacts of cold in places around the world that don't get that cold. And we can find impacts of heat in places around the world that don't get that hot. So this is actually really important because there's a lot of discussion of heat waves. There is growing discussion of what's called non-optimal temperature, which is basically you're anywhere off that minimum temperature. But this is really important for climate change because climate change isn't just increasing heat waves, it's making every hot day a little hotter on average. Um, and so even if it's not that hot, depending on that community, there could be a really important public health impact. Another point I wanna make here is that the, the relationships are quite different for different locations, even in a given city. And this is really important when we think about what are potential mitigation measures for different cities. So there's different urban, well, these are all very urban areas, but just more broadly across the world, there's different levels of urbanization, different green space, different populations, different heat wave action plans. And I think we, I mean, there's been some work on that, but I think we really still need more work looking at why populations that have some similarities, like all major urban centers in India, respond quite differently to heat. We also, something that's not shown on this figure, but I wanna share with you something else we found interesting about India was, was the response to heat waves. So if you look at heat waves in the United States, not all heat waves are created equal. So, you know, they could be longer, one could be longer than another, one could be more intense and burn hotter, but the most harmful heat wave in the US is on average the first one in the warm season. And then people address mitigation, they drink water, they you know, adapt, they stay inside and so on. In India, we found the opposite each heat wave was more harmful than the last on average. And so I would say the results are not fully conclusive, but it was very suggestive that the most harmful heat wave in India is the last heat wave of the season. So these are some other really clear indications that there are very different things happening across different populations. And so that's some of the things we're looking at for temperature and heat and sorry, temperature and mortality or other forms of health outcomes is not just looking at heat, but also looking at cold, um, looking at heat rather than just heat waves, but also, and what I'm showing here is looking at what are some of the different factors that affect why some people respond to heat differently, either at the individual level or the community level. And here I wanna highlight work by Dr. Wan He Lee, who is a former postdoc of mine. And here we're looking at for all the districts in South Korea, looking at how heat and mortality differs by level of urbanization. And you can see within the rural areas, as you get more and more rural, heat becomes more and more harmful. Then as you move to a low density urban area, like the small towns, um, as you get more dense, more urban, it becomes more harmful. Then it kind of levels off. And then in the high density areas, it goes up again. So the world is undergoing unprecedented levels of urbanization everywhere the US, it, like everywhere. Um, but it's also changing rural areas as well. Urban areas do not create their own food, for example, and so on. So I think that there ideally should be more work looking at rural areas and urban areas in the urban-rural divide. One thing that is um, interesting to me, if you look at the environmental health literature, largely due to data availability and sample size, the vast, vast majority of it is based on urban areas. And urban areas are really, imp really important, but NIEHS actually, uh, sorry, NIH actually identifies rural areas um, as an environmental justice population as well. So imagine if someone is a racial ethnic minority population and poor and living in a rural area, well, they're quite likely triply hit. So I think we need more understanding of how urbanization, both rapid change in urbanization and differences between rural and urban areas are affecting human health and how the environment impacts human health. Um, and so one of the things uh, we did for another study to try to look at differences in, in 
in weather and health was to look at differences in green space. And this is work by my senior PhD student, Haiyan. And here we're looking at over 400 different cities in, I'm going to blank on the number. I want to say it's 21, 24, the low 20s number of countries. And we had in-country collaborators for every country um, looking at how the relationship between heat and mortality in a given city and how does that differ by the city's green space. Um, and I, I want to show this map so you can see where the cities are. So it is, to my knowledge, the largest study on heat and mortality in green space that's been conducted. Uh, there could be another study I'm not aware of that's larger. And it's very impressive that it has so many cities, but there's huge parts of the world not included at all as well. And this is just some of her results. Oh, it's 24 countries. So here, if you look at overall um, the mortality risk, so we, we generated those nonlinear terms and then we pulled off the difference between the risk at the 99th percentile temperature. So very, very hot to the minimum mortality temperature. So it's just pulling two points off that curve. But you can see for total mortality, as you move up in green space, it becomes less harmful. For CVD mortality, as you move up in green space, it becomes less harmful. And for respiratory mortality, as you move up in green space, it becomes less harmful. This is really interesting. This is not the issue of green space making the area cooler. This is the increment of mortality for a given increment in temperature. It's not the same thing as green space cooling the temperature. So as we have unprecedented urbanization, a lot of urban planners are of course thinking about different ways to incorporate green space and there's different types of green space to incorporate. I think this shows a really clear health benefit of incorporating green space into urban areas. Um, but there's also a lot of work I think needs to be done on the different pathways through which green space is helpful for human health. Is it lowering the um, urban heat island effect, which is really helpful? Is it lowering pollution effects, which is really helpful? Depending on the type of green space, is it physical exercise? Is it social cohesion? And so on. And I want to mention the issue of environmental justice, which of course is the concept that some individuals and communities face a higher public health burden from environmental conditions than others. The black and white photos are actually from Warren County, North Carolina in 1982, where a PCB dump was built um, in Warren County, which was one of the poorest counties in one of the poorest states. The county had nothing to do with the production of that waste or the company that produced it or anything like that. Um, but I actually remember, I, I'm from North Carolina, but I remember watching the evening news and seeing these protests. And it was very striking, even then, kind of the integration of civil rights and environmental concerns that were happening together in Warren County, which um, is considered kind of the birthplace of the environmental justice movement for the United States. And so we now have decades of research showing conclusively that racial ethnic minority populations and low income populations face a higher risk. But here I'm gonna argue that there's lots of other types of populations that face disproportionate risk as well. And here I wanna show you some work from my former postdoc, uh, Kelvin Fong. And he published three landmark papers, in my opinion, looking at immigrant health in relation to environmental conditions, particularly air pollution. And so this is a figure he made just to kind of show simply some of the things he was finding in his more advanced models. This is dividing every county in the US into one of four categories based on, does it have above or below the median percent of immigrants, in this case from Africa, and above or below the median in terms of um, premature mortality to uh, attributable to PM 2.5, which is really in, in, for this analysis was related to level of PM 2.5. So the counties in red have a higher than median um, immigrant population from Africa, and then they have a high air pollution level as well for PM 2.5. And the counties in green have a low percent immigrant population from Africa and a low PM 2.5. And you can see looking at the map, there's a whole lot of red on there and not very much green. So there are a variety of different reasons why um, immigrants from different parts of the world are distributed the way they are across the United States due to economic opportunities, due to cultural hubs and so on. But one of the things that Kelvin really found is that the, this distribution results in, for many populations, a higher air pollution exposure as well, especially for immigrants from Africa. And I think when this is combined with 
different access to health care, potential language barriers, and so on, that we have a and racism and so on, and income, we have some, a potential additional dimension to an environmental justice question. So there has not been a whole lot of work on environmental justice and immigrant populations, but I think that Kelvin's work shows that there, uh, this is really very needed. And I wanna share with you another environmental justice study that we did looking at green infrastructure in urban spaces. So of course, as I mentioned, we're very interested in, in green space, especially in the urban environment. And this is looking at different structures of green space that, that are like not like a big park, but different types of engineered urban green space. And this is my former PhD student, Alicia Chan. I realize those numbers are kind of small, but I'm gonna walk through what are some of the key points. So she looked at um, Washington, DC and looked at where these green infrastructures for stormwater control measures were put. And here's what she found. They were more likely to be cited in communities of color and low-income communities. So had, had we stopped here, had Alicia stopped there, the story looks like maybe there's not a real environmental justice concern because these disadvantaged communities are more likely to get stormwater control measures than other communities. But she didn't stop there. We also looked at temporal trends, which you can tell I'm very interested in because I keep mentioning it. So we wanted to look at not just where those site, where those structures were cited, but what was happening to the composition of those communities before they were cited and after they were cited. And these are just some of her work. This is looking at the change in community demographics after a stormwater control measure installation for a green infrastructure and their bars are color coded based on whether or not they got a green infrastructure. So in white, those are census tracts that got none. And then in the kind of pink to maroon, those got green infrastructures, the darker the color, the more infrastructure they got. And so you can see that overall on average, communities that did not get a stormwater control measure became less white and the communities that did became more white. And it's not a, not a perfect line, but roughly the more uh, green infrastructure they got, the wider they became. And then if we look at the uh, percent black, on average, all those community tracks were becoming less black, but more so when they got more green infrastructure. And then for Hispanic Latino populations, we saw on average, all the census tracts were, were having a higher Hispanic Latino population, but less so the more and more infrastructure they got. They got. So this is a classic green gentrification problem. Um, and we are not saying that the government of Washington DC was doing this on purpose or anything like that. As we said, they initially cited more of these facilities in uh, disadvantaged communities. But I think it's really important not to just have these types of, in of engineered solutions and not think about what happens afterwards. Because if we really wanna think about who's benefiting from this green infrastructure, it is not those disadvantaged communities because of this green gentrification. Um, and then one last thing I wanna mention about environmental justice for a population that I think should be studied in relation to environmental justice is the LGBTQ plus population. So this is a paper, I, a figure from a paper I did with Leo Goldsmith, who was a former master's student of mine, who's actually joining us back for a PhD starting September. Um, and the, the paper is called Queering Environmental Justice, which I think is a great title, but Leo came up with that. I'm not gonna take credit for that. But the basic idea of this paper was to go through different ways in which the LGBT, LGBTQ plus population could be at higher risk from environmental contaminants. There's been very little research on this, but the limited research that exists is very suggestive that there is something happening. So just to give you a few concrete examples, there are documented cases of people being denied their life affirming medication during cases of environmental disasters. There are cases of people being turned away, trans people being turned away from shelters during cases of environmental disasters. There's documented cases of LGBTQ plus populations being unsafe in such shelters and so on. And then there are several other um, examples of pathways through which we hypothesize this population could be at higher risk of public health burden from an environmental contaminants. So what we're doing in this paper is really calling on the environmental health community to start investigating this issue. This also of course relates to uh, 
the issue of intersectionality. So imagine a, uh, an individual that is LGBTQ+, plus, but also a racial ethnic minority, perhaps also low income and so on. Well, now they're triply hit in terms of their potential uh, vulnerability. And so I've talked about the past and said I'm gonna kind of move us towards the future. So I just do wanna highlight climate change and health. This is a slide I update every year on, these are just articles in PubMed that have climate change and health in the title and abstract, title and or abstract. So I'm clearly not capturing every article, but I think it's a really good indication of the incredible growth in articles on this topic. Um, one thing that I tell my students, which kind of blows their mind, is that when I was in PhD school, I read all the articles on climate change and health, like all of them, not, not because I read so much, but because there were just so few, like it was, you could do that. Um, so this shows us this phenomenal growing scientific interest in evidence in climate change and health. What this graph doesn't show you is what do all those articles find? Well, we know from IPCC and review articles and systematic and scoping reviews that overwhelmingly using different disciplines, different study locations, different methods, these studies overwhelmingly show enormous human health impacts from climate change. But I'm also going to argue the impacts are even larger. This is a, a figure I, I got from some early report. Well, these are categories I got from some early reports on climate change saying that there would be impacts on agriculture, forests, species and ecosystems, water resources, and coastal areas. It's only in relative recent years that human health has been pulled out as a specific topic for climate change and health reports. It was not in the, some of the original ones. It is now. Um, but I argue that all of this could be related to climate and health. So for agriculture, we could think of nutrition and access to healthy food. Um, for species and ecosystems, we could think about the urban wildlife interface and disease for water resources. We could think of water scarcity, saltwater intrusion, conflict related to resources, environmental refugees related to resources, and so on. And then of course, our kind of classic ones where we look at human health. So I think that this is something that some of us were discussing earlier today, like what is climate change and health and how does it different from studies of health in general? Um, but I think that the actual study of climate change and health really should encompass a lot more than it current, currently does. And so last, I just have a few more slides and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions and discussion. But I just wanna highlight a, a few issues, I have three of things I think are important, but rarely get discussed. And so I'm kind of taking the speaker's prerogative to share them with you. And so one of them is what I call small data. So in my field, um, there is a lot of discussion and work on big data and high computational methods and machine learning and so on, and I'm all for it. And I do it and everybody does it and we should all do it. The challenge is the places that are most vulnerable for climate change and environmental conditions often do not have big data. Yes, we can use remote sensing and so on. We can't validate it the same way we can here. And so this is from a paper from my former PhD students, um, Amruta Nori Sarma and Anoba Garang, looking at small data. And this kind of described data on health that uh, we collected in Nepal and India and talks about the challenges and advantages of small data. So just for some examples, for Nepal, um, much of the data we collected was on paper. Some of the hospitals in Kathmandu Valley <clears throat> We're starting to move to a computerized system, but they got rid of, like destroyed their paper records after five years. So after we had collected for some time frame, we had the largest, you know, at six years, we had the largest health data set for hospital missions in Kathmandu Valley because the hospital didn't have the resources. Um, some of them were not using ICD codes. They were just, you know, physician's notes of what they thought was the diagnosis um, and then so on. So there's a lot of issues with small data. I will say in trying to publish work on this, it is more difficult to publish work when you don't have an ICD code. But it, was the, it is the, literally the best data available in the world. And so if we do not embrace small data, then we cannot study some of the most, crit, in my opinion, cannot study some of the most critical environmental health challenges. So I think we definitely need to keep with big data, but I make an argument that we should not forget the advantage of small data as well. The second issue I just want to raise 
is that in environmental health, environmental justice is discussed all the time. Um, but there's also issues, I think, of who is actually conducting the science. This is from a study um, led by Ji Young Sun, research scientist in our group, looking at corresponding authors for 57 uh, journals across different categories. Uh, we did not have data on race ethnicity, um, but I, I imagine figures uh, would be very revealing in, to, to show the very uneven distribution of scientists in terms of race ethnicity. But we looked at this for <clears throat> journals by different categories. So for astronomy and astrophysics, almost 90% of the corresponding authors for those papers were men. Um, bioscience, even in environmental science, it was about 80%. Interdisciplinary work, surprising to me, still very, very high uh, in materials and mathematics and physics and so on. We also looked at this breakdown by country, by time, by pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Any way we looked at it, this is the figure. Um, so I think that's important to think. I mean, this is just one way we could divide it up for men, men and women. Um, but there's other ways we could think about who is actually represented in science and what types, what does that mean for the types of research questions that we study? What does that mean for how we design our analysis? And what does that mean for how we present and interpret our results? And then the, the final thing I want to mention is that I am, I feel bad for John because I feel like I've mentioned this like eight times since I've been on this visit, but I am fascinated with flat earth. Uh, and science denialism. And the middle photo is a flat earth conference from Denver, taking place in Denver. So there are many people who legitimately believe that the earth is flat, like going against science that has been known in some capacity for a thousand years. I mean, it's incredible. And this has real world implications. It's not just like, oh, well, that's kind of funny. They think that. I mean, we see this happening with climate change. We see this happening with the vaccine and COVID-19, and I'm, I don't have solutions. Oh, in the upper right-hand picture, this is a protest against vaccines um, in New Haven, Connecticut. So it can happen anywhere. Um, but I think this is really important. And so I just highlight this just to raise the issue. I think it's time for the scientific community to start discussing scientific denialism. What I hear discussed a lot is what I'm calling, going to call scientific literacy. Right, so train, train me to write a better press release, tell scientists to go talk to communities more, go talk to the press more and so on. All of that, again, we should do, that's really great. I don't know that scientific literacy is gonna solve scientific denialism. So again, sorry, I don't have a solution, but I think, it, I think the scientific community needs to start addressing this, that it's not, um, it's not just that they don't understand what we're saying, it's that they don't wanna hear what we have to say, some people. So I think it's time to start having that conversation. And that will involve disciplines far different from my own to try to figure out some solutions and pathways there. And so I just want to bring us back to this, this concept of everything being connected. And that's the figure that I like from uh, that paper a few years ago on the left-hand side. And I'm going to add in several things to this. This is happening under the pandemic. Um, un it's incredible urbanization all over the world concerns of environmental justice, climate change, and some things I didn't talk about as much, but we all know that there is growing economic inequality, an increasingly diverse population, a rapidly aging population for much of the world, including here, um, and then other issues like small data and who is conducting the science and scientific denialism. So I think that I like to think of these broad systems and how they interact. And I think that it's time to add in some other systems and other concepts as well. And with that, I wanna thank all of you so much for spending some of your day with me and thank my team and my funding sponsors. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. You covered a lot of territory. And uh, why don't we open up for uh, Comments, uh, discussion, questions, uh, whatever anybody would like to pile on. And I'm always loaded with comments and questions. Uh, Dick.
very bland uh, coach who is making those things post post. That is, you know, this is not a bunch of red of a nerve piece, but just a bunch of very organized, very powerful, very um, rich people who do some very strange things, and they're not all boys. And you can make money or be better in politics, whatever, through pushing false narratives across a number of those arenas. You know, no, we listen to you, this is really uh, red line decisions, and that's not why minorities really all kind of live in the same area as you had. <coughs> I'm just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent point, and clearly you're, you're right. I mean, I think that I mean, I, I'm not an expert in why these things occur. I really think we do need other disciplines to to come in and study this, and I'm sure some of them are, but to connect with us, because it's very frustrating to me as a scientist to feel like my work that's designed to be policy relevant and really be impactful to improve society, it's not getting used in the way that it could. But I think, I think we, you know, have multiple things happening. We have the intentional misdirection, misuse, and flat-out lies. And then I think we have confusion and so on. I think a lot of what you said is what's happening. I don't know what's happening here. This is this is the thing that makes me think maybe there's something else happening. There's also a whole other conspiracy. Maybe somebody is. So so that's the the, the only thing that makes me think that in addition to what you said, which I agree with, that maybe there's something else happening societally with the rejection of authority. Um, so I, I but but it's quite likely we have all these multiple things happening happening at the same time. Yeah, well I never thought I'd say those are moving voting systems. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens in the next two weeks. I think Michelle did a quote Buffalo Springfield. Something is happening here. What it is is not exactly clear. <laughs> you were quite close. Okay, I wasn't <laughs> uh, other uh, comments or thoughts to add in? Yes. Let me repeat the, uh, the, so the folks on the web can hear the uh, question. The question from Lange was about uh, basically sort of the global connections and uh, the rainforest and the uh, issues that arise with them. And I, I suppose there's a whole. Pay for what? Right. Um, and so, I mean, I think. I mean, it's very, very difficult. Um, the people that created the biggest problems, the United States and others, um, are, were the greatest to benefit from, you know, wreaking havoc on using natural resources and so on. And so, I mean, there's, you know, I mean, there's this beautiful map. I'm sure most everyone has seen it, showing, you know, who's who contributed the most to greenhouse gas emissions, and you can just flip it with um, GDP. I mean, it's it's clear. It's a very strong relationship. Richer countries are contributing the most damage. And then for those richer countries who contributed the most damage to then ask any other country, poor or rich, to number one, not do, don't do what we did. And number two, we expect you to pay for things. It's it's There's big ethical issues there as well. It's one of the reasons I'm interested in philosophy and global ethics. On the other hand, like, I don't want everyone in the world to do what the U.S. did, <laughs> and we know things now that we didn't know then. But I mean, it is it is really really challenging. I think part of my personal view, since you asked, is that and I'll speak for living as someone who's born and raised and lives in the U.S. I think it is very difficult for us to ethically ask other countries to behave differently than we did and to pay for things when we're not changing and we're not 
paying for things. So, um, you know, the, the, the average miles per gallon of the Model T was 25 miles per gallon. Like it's not technology, it's our choice. We have chosen to, to have this level of energy consumption and, and so on. So I think that, the, that there's kind of a loss of moral authority in my personal view to make those type of decisions, but do I, I don't have a solution. I think, I think, I don't know if I answered the question you asked, but <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Yeah, there are other questions and uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we have a way, unfortunately, to get um, questions from those who are online and I apologize for that. And I think we came on a little bit late uh, for the online folks. And uh, again, sorry, we had, a, there were some technical uh, challenges uh, apparently. Uh, Michelle, I mean, maybe just back, maybe a, a good place to end could be your thoughts of going back to our earlier conversation today and, you know, things that are all on our mind is, you know, what what is the what should the Colorado School of Public Health, our campus, our university, Yale, you know, we can keep going down the list. What 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 do we do? I mean, if research money comes, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. And um, and we all want to make a um, a difference. Um, and you know, I think the biggest challenge for all of us, and I think you've put a lot of thought into this is, you know, how do we do something and try and make a difference? Yeah, it's really hard. And I want to, I want to end on a more optimistic slide. So I'm going to move to this one, <laughs> get off the COVID deniers. Um, so, I mean, I think that in terms of research, I think that, you know, I always try to do policy relevant research that's going to make a big impact on society. But I think that we need more, and we always say we need interdisciplinary work, but then when you look at funding agencies, that's not exactly what most agencies fund. I mean, there's some, but when I say interdisciplinary, I mean like sociology, anthropology, environmental historians, economists, chemists. I don't mean like chemistry and chemical engineering, <laughs> you know, uh, and things like that. So b because of this, this slide, have, have all these things are connected. And the second point I want to make is that I think we as scientists have to not just make great research and kind of throw it over the fence and, you know, put out a press release maybe, and then feel that we did our, did a great job. I mean, it's, it's really hard, but like for whatever reason, for many reasons, it's not being, the science is not being used. Uh, the way that I think that it could be to really make an, an informed impact. So, I mean, I always try to do science that's not telling people what to do, but helps them make an informed decision. I view that as kind of my role as a scientist. But, you know, I, there's there's clearly something else happening with the, the rejection of, of science that we see on a, a wide scale that's really stopping the uptake of all this great science. So I think we need more you know, transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. And I think we need some learning into how to get that message out. And it is not just training people to write a better press release. But I will say that, you know, that here at this and these universities, you're in a great position where you have people who are great epidemiologists and statisticians and atmospheric scientists and NCAR and all these great, um, you know, connections that are already kind of built right here. So I'm sure lots of people are doing uh, well, I know lots of people are doing great work with that, but you really have an amazing opportunity, I think, to keep going. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Michelle. I think you'll have to come back for the uh, 10th Hammond Lecture and uh, give us a progress report. Hopefully it will be a, um, a good one. So I want to thank um, everybody for uh, joining today. Those of you online, uh, thanks for your participation. And if you missed the first segment of this, we will be posting the um, recording. Just uh, tomorrow, there are further opportunities to talk with Michelle. We have um, meetings from 9 to 10 and 10 to 11 in the Dean's Conference Room on the third floor of the Fitzsimmons Building. And the first, we plan to talk about education. The second, policy and advocacy. But I suspect they'll just all run into each other and we'll continue to talk about what we should be um, doing. Uh, for those of you who are here, we have very light and informal refreshments at the back of the uh, room and an opportunity to just continue a conversation with uh, Michelle. So once again, thanks so much for joining today.